All right, we're joined by Professor Patricia Casey, psychiatrist at the Matter Hospital and Fergal Rooney, senior counselling psychologist at St. John of God Hospital. Uh, Amanda, someone happy in the career, doesn't think she's doing any harm. What do you think? Well, Amanda is one of the very lucky ones. Um, it's a fascinating read if you, if you read um, the work of Martin Amos the uh, famous novelist and he spent quite a bit of time in California visiting the studios in California and in different parts of the United States studying this where and he was a very strong proponent of the, um, the sexual revolution in the 1960s but what he found in the pornography industry in California and in the US absolutely horrified him and he has written very forcibly about the um, the abuse that the women suffered the misogyny that they suffered, the, um, the, 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 the appalling way that they were treated, the total disregard for them. In, in various magazines and papers, The Guardian, um, he did an, an interview recently for Slate magazine, he's in The New Yorker, he has, he's been writing about it since then, of his horror at what he so found. So he sees the production process as abusive he sees it and as... people suffer from it. Fergal, what about the people who come to you who are the users of porn? I mean, how damaged are they and are they typical or are they exceptional in the damage? Yeah, I think there's going to be a, a wide range of, of statistics that we could trot out about that. But I think the, the most reliable research around it seems to suggest that about 85% of, of people who view pornography do so in a recreational way. And it doesn't seem to have any significant impact on their own personal sexual functioning, on their relationships or on their just sense of themselves. But is that therefore the same as alcohol? Uh, or gambling. Many people will have a, a punt on a horse, will not become a compulsive gambler. Many people have a drink, don't become an alcoholic. Are you saying that the use of porn recreationally is fine? It would seem to be that it doesn't have the type of impact that some people would, would suggest porn has in putting it forward as being something evil and unacceptable and that we have to combat at every opportunity. I think, though, in, in my work in St. John God Hospital, what I see a lot of are the people who fall into the 15% category that are outside of that 85% recreational users. And what appears to be going on there is that people, uh, through watching various amounts of pornography, it doesn't seem to be volume as much as the impact that it has on the individual in terms of their sense of themselves, in terms of their ability to engage in intimate relationships, in terms of their ability to function sexually, and in terms of their ability just to regulate the amount of pornography that they might be viewing. And so some people go on to be very compulsive in their use of pornography. And clearly that's damaging, because there's all sorts of effects that fall for people then. Their lives are impacted. It may be that their relationships become harmed. I saw a bumper sticker in, in uh, the States uh, recently which read that porn kills love. And I think for some people, porn can kill the ability to be in a loving, yeah. intimate relationship. Now, Patricia, it's not going to go away. As I mentioned, it's a couple of clicks away on your smartphone. So banning it, you could do it in this jurisdiction. It's, by the way, hardcore porn is legal in this country as long as the images don't depict any act that is illegal in, in Ireland. So it's not going to go away. So how do you cope with it? Before I answer that, though, I think it's important, Pat, that the, that the audience and the viewers understand what modern pornography is like. It's not like the leadish magazines. It's not like Playboy magazine where you see, you know, pictures of attractive looking women displaying their legs or whatever. It is violent. It's it involves children, it involves animals, it involves death in some cases. And these images are available at the click of a 15-year-old's mobile telephone. So that's really what we're talking about. We're not talking about the nice cuddly images that might help the couples might want to watch recreationally in their own home. So is the Taoiseach right? Do we need to have a national we conversation about do. porn? I absolutely support that. And we need to talk about what is currently available. And, and that is what is troubling. And that is what's causing the problems for people who use pornography on a regular basis, is the violence, the, the escalation that people need to get more and more of a buzz, um, and so they become addicted to it. And there, there have been a number of studies from the University of um, Cambridge, from the Max Planck Institute, from the University of Oklahoma, from all around the place, indicating that people who view this very hardcore, or not even very hard, just hardcore pornography, and view it regularly, have a tendency to escalate 
the, um, the graphicness of what they watch in order to get the but same response. For, for, does it, uh, porn have any therapeutic benefit uh, as sex therapy? Does it have any, any educational benefit? I think you'll certainly hear people who report that their use of porn is educational. Uh, I think you'll hear people report that it is uh, recreational and that it enhances their sexual lives and people can use it in that way. I think though it's important to, re to remember that uh, you know the Taoiseach calls for a, a national conversation and I would very much welcome that because I think in our attitude towards porn in, in Ireland, I think there has been a push towards normalising porn in everyday life, and there's an ambivalence that goes with porn uh, along with that. And that ambivalence suggests that this is harmless, that this doesn't really hurt anybody. I think it's important, and it's something that just comes through time in, time out in my clinical work, that... Um, for a lot of people, porn is not harmless, and it does have a significant effect. That 15%, it does have a significant effect, and it really impacts on their lives okay. in quite significant uh, We've got some ways. people in our audience. Uh, Shauna Scott, where's Shauna? Um, you uh, have a, a business called sexshopper.ie, isn't that yep. so? Yep, and, that's me. <laughs> and what, what does it do? Um, I stock um, sex toys and accessories, um, all made from body safe materials, so that's what I, I specialize in. Do you sell porn? I don't sell porn. Um, the reason why I don't is not because I don't want to, um, but because my, my bank that I do merchant services through does not allow me to. But you have an IE domain, don't you? I do uh, have do an IE domain. You're not allowed to sell porn on the IE domain, as far as I know. Um, I'm not sure. Like, I do have a very good relationship with the i.e. domain registry, so I could, I could find that out. <laughs> All right. Now, now, you've heard what um, our panel have been saying, yeah. uh, and you've also heard what a sex worker has been saying yes. about this. Where, where do you see yourself and your uh, sex shopper.ie fitting into that whole scene? Yeah. Well, I'm, I think personally I would take great exception to what Patricia was saying and that um, porn involves children and animals. Those... That is not porn. That is recorded abuse. So to conflate those two, I find deeply but disturbing. But isn't there a very seamless divide between it? As people go deeper and deeper into pornography, they find more and more extreme things. Uh, n no, not necessarily. I mean, as someone who has used porn and does watch porn, um, I yeah, I just take great exception to that. Um, I think that that puts me on a like that puts me on a level with someone who is watching recorded abuse and I just do not see that that way. So, so you feel that, that most people would be able to say if they inadvertently came across a, uh, a snuff movie site or something like that, that they would walk away from it and say enough is enough or would they be drawn in? I don't think that people inadvertently come across snuff videos. I think you really have to look for something like that. But also, like as you were saying, um, porn isn't going to go away. Um, there, there's no point in trying to ban it or censor it. I think it's important that we, we have these awkward conversations with, these, with our kids um, as parents, and we need to teach our kids to be more media savvy um, and to apply critical thinking when it comes okay. to what we're looking well, at on uh, the internet. We have Caroline O'Sullivan, Director of Services at the ISPCC. Uh, children as young as what? watching porn? Well, I think we can have examples of very young children and they kind of come across porn by accident. That could be a situation where their parents might be watching it and they walk in. But I think when we look at the calls we get in Chiline, over a thousand calls every day, we would get a large number of calls from 10, 11, 12 year olds who are accessing porn and accessing it fairly regularly. And why are they ringing you? What is disturbing them? Well, they're ringing us because they mightn't have sought it out themselves initially but a friend might have shown them, they might have been on a sleepover, and they saw it and it really scared them. So they don't want to talk to their parents about it, they're afraid they to? They feel they can't. And I think that is why the ISPCC really, really welcomes what the Taoiseach has said. We've been looking for a cyber safety strategy. Pornography is one part of that discussion. Do you think the parents haven't a clue? No, some parents do. Some parents absolutely do, and I agree. Do they know, though, that it's three clicks on your smartphone yeah, and you're I in? Absolutely. Parents do have a clue, but I think they just forget. Like, if you look at what's happening now in comparison to five years ago, the advice ISPCC would have given is keep your computer in the sitting room. 
It has nothing to do with computers no now. It's iPads, it's phones, and I think very often parents inadvertently give their seven and eight year olds smartphones. Those seven and eight year olds are not mature enough to understand it. Right. They will come across this information and they are suffering. They are worried, they are scared, they are upset. Okay. So we have to as a nation. Well, someone who, who's uh, actually studying all this, Caroline Ryan, a uh, scholar in sexuality studies, you're doing a PhD on porn and feminism. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure about the intersection there. Maybe you'll explain. Um, it's kind of looking at the experiences of female porn stars and how they're spoken about. Um, so, what did you make of Amanda? Um, well, thanks, Amanda, for sharing your story. And a large part of my research is looking at how the debate on porn actually constitutes an act of violence um, to silence someone and dismiss them as being non-representative when you don't actually know the ins and outs of the, of the industry and you're an outsider constitutes an act of epistemological violence and it constitutes um, stigma, it constitutes real-life harm as well. So it d denies the performer agency to define their own experiences and to tell their own so, stories. So what's your own attitude based on your studies to porn? and the widespread availability, the ubiquity of it. Yeah, the porn is two things. Porn is an argument, porn is also an industry. But we're having this national debate about porn when we're not actually having national debates about sex education and what consent is. Absolutely. And we're making all these wild claims that porn is child abuse. It's not child abuse. There is no building next door to the gangbang building that sells child porn DVDs or the animal bestiality. That's an underground network. That's not an official regulated business that pays tax. So conflating those two contributes to moral panics. And we've seen this like, since porn was invented. Do, in, like, so are you in favour of, say, of a regulated, healthy porn industry? where people are properly paid, properly health screened, mm -hmm. yeah. would that be your view and yeah. that adults could mm -hmm. access it um, in yeah. an appropriate way? I think consent and adults are adults and they know they make their own decisions about what to get into and there's also a huge network of adult performers who are more than capable of talking about their own lives mm -hmm. without other people having to apply their veneer of respectability uh, in okay. order for their words uh, to Just go back to, to, to Fergal and Patricia, just briefly, you've heard some of the comments there. There are obviously diverse views and obviously a need for that national conversation. There are indeed and I suppose I think r hearing people's concerns about the, the impact of, on children of viewing some of the pornography material that's available, I think it constantly strikes me how have we arrived at the point where we have a discussion about the impact of pornography on children and don't stop and say how have we got here? We yeah. have a problem if, we're, if this is what we're concerned. Because again, back to the clinical work I do, I meet people and constantly in the stories, there's negative early sexualization experiences that is part of their story that has impacted on their psychosexual de development. Okay, Patricia? Um, I mean, some of the speakers there have said that, you know, adults are capable of making their own decisions about the, the behaviours they engage in. But you're forgetting that at the other end, at the other side of the screen, there is an audience. And the purpose of pornography is not to educate couples who may be having sexual difficulties. The purpose of pornography solely is to make money for an industry. It's a 97 billion pound industry internationally and that's its sole purpose. So I don't think we should be dressing it up as some kind of gentle exploration of our sexuality. It is a very corrupt business. All right, Patricia, uh, thank you very much. And it turns out that 30,000 people click onto a porn website every second.